to another edition of Talks at Google. I'm Suresh Gupta, a software engineer working with the Google Maps team. And I'm honored to be uh, hosting today's session because we have a guest who is uh, a very talented violinist. She is well known among the musical community in India. She has performed on some of the most prestigious and reputed stages, events, festivals across the world. Uh, you might have seen her perform live or on stage, either solo or with her family, because she's the daughter of uh, an illustrious violinist, Dr. Sangeeta Shankar. And she's also the granddaughter of a legendary violinist, Padma Bhushan, Dr. N. Rajam. So without any delays, let's, uh, let's welcome Ragni Shankar. Thank you, Ragni, for the musical greeting. Um, we'll just uh, thanks a lot uh, for I, I, uh, for all the viewers who want to who were left wanting more for that violin. I would say that we have, we have more to come, so just stay with us. And uh, welcome, Ragni. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Suryash. It's such a pleasure and such an honor for me to be at uh, Talks at Google. And thank you very much for the warm invitation. It is, uh, for me, it's like a dream come true today to be at Google, the very uh, platform with which I have grown up. <laughs> yeah, uh, we are just equally pleased to have you here. So yeah. um, let's talk about something, Sarni. Uh, starting yeah. with a very obvious question. So your yeah. name. Ragni, I know it has something to do with music, but yeah. can you tell the audience what does it mean and if there is an, if there's a story behind it? Definitely. In fact, uh, it's uh, something which very few people know about. So my name, uh, Ragini, uh, actually before I was born, both my grandmothers, that is my mother's mother as well as my father's mother, both sides, you know, very much by chance, by coincidence, both of them thought of the name Ragini for me. So mm -hmm. it was such a coincidence, first of all, that itself. And right. uh, and so my mom was very surprised when, you know, she got to know that both the grandmothers want the same name. And to top it all, you know, with Indian classical music, it goes so well because uh, the whole um, the whole concept of Indian classical music is based on ragas. On based right. on melodies. So um, raga is basically the male form and ragini is its female form. So uh, ragini is, so rag, ragini, the entire concept goes together. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, uh, how do I say, um, for me, since I'm in Indian classical music, it's just such a coincidence that my name fits so well with, with my profession. And not right. only that, because uh, my name also means uh, the word love. So, you know, it's music also. On one hand, it means melody. And on the other hand, right. it means love. And both these things are like uh, very, very dear to my heart. And my profession shows my love for music. So I think my name yeah, is yeah. apt. Definitely. Because uh, so you mentioning about your family, we uh, it's no surprise that they named you something like that because uh, we've heard that uh, several generations before you from your family have been involved in music. Uh, right. uh, just throw some light on that. Definitely. In fact, uh, you know, you should know this, that uh, in our family, uh, actually, I'm the eighth generation. Me and my sister Nandini, we both are violinists. So mm -hmm. we are the eighth generation in our family uh, of musicians. So basically, right. my uh, grandmother, my mother, 
me and nandini we do three generations on the violin concerts mm -hmm. so and before that um, my grandmother's father he was also um, a violinist i mean not by a uh, profession uh, he didn't play professionally but he was a very very good teacher and okay. before that the uh, generations they uh, basically they were all singers so you know to to uh, carry on the tradition for eight generations it definitely feels very very i feel very privileged right and yeah. uh, so uh, like um, how did you like when did you start playing the violin and how did you get uh, introduced to this of course your mother and your grandmother both play that but uh, mm -hmm. how did it become like a passion for you um so uh, in our family actually we have a tradition that mm -hmm. uh, when a child turns 3 right uh, in, i mean whether it was me or nandini we were handed over the violin at that age you know it's not a choice mm -hmm. but uh, it's something that comes with the family so uh, that was something that was uh, a very natural process something that we didn't even think about you know a 3 mm -hmm. year old child can't really uh, think about what it wants to do right. but over the course of years i think what happened is that we uh, really developed an interest for it we really became passionate about it although mm -hmm. i think the beginning years were very uh, uh, we it was very difficult <laughs> for my parents and right. our grandmother because you know to make a young child practice and that to every day it's a task but then once we got through that stage i think till around 13 14 we realized the the worth of what we were doing by then yeah. already 10 years had gone down into practice mm -hmm. so after that i think nobody had to tell us to practice it came very naturally and that's the reason our passion then became our profession much later on when we started performing live right so yeah. um like uh, in uh, i i'm sure most people would know about this there has been a tradition uh, there is this something called student teacher tradition or what is known in hindi as guru shishya parampara which okay. used to follow for musical uh, Uh, i mean for musical gharanas for all those uh, training and practice and discipline so how was it for you to i mean to be brought up by teacher like people in your own house and what kind <laughs> of discipline what kind of routine did you stick to uh in india actually the guru shishya parampara uh, the teacher student tradition it's actually right. a very very unique very uh, interesting concept because uh, what used to happen in earlier times is that the student used to be so dedicated to the teacher that they used to live 24 hours uh, with the teacher they used to leave their families and come to live uh, at the okay. teacher's place because they used to because music would not just be a profession it would not just be um how do you say a uh, something that you practice for a few hours and leave but right. it would really be a way of life because mm. you would teach your you would uh, see your teacher every day in action not just when they are teaching you but even off of the teaching room you know yeah, you right. would learn so many things so music in india was like that and even for me and uh i mean and of course my mother also since we've all learned from our grandmother and in my case i've had the privilege of learning from both of them so yeah. so it's been so nice because music has been in the family all throughout every day in our house you know it's an atmosphere filled with music even when we are not practicing either we are listening to music or there is some activity related to music so that's why i think uh, uh, i think our earlier years our school years were very formative and they were very good years because uh, uh, in fact uh, our grandmother she was uh, an emeritus professor in banaras hindu university okay. so um, for 40 years and mm -hmm. we used to live in bombay when i was very uh, i mean we used to live in navi mumbai is what i meant to say mm -hmm. so uh, our grandmother shifted all the way from banaras to mumbai just to teach us and her house was was about 1 hour away from our house so what we used to do is every day uh, we used to travel all that way and that too we selected a school which was near her house so you right. know every day after school so our days would begin very early start start somewhere around 6 yeah around 6 um that is mm -hmm. leaving home from 6 at 6 okay. you know getting right. ready even earlier and then uh, uh, going to school and then going to her house and then practicing there and then coming back our days used to be very very long 
so even after right. coming back you know our play time evening play time with friends used to be like very less because uh, <laughs> we selected a school near her house we used to practice with her so i think as um, uh, for education seek uh, uh, in uh, generally in uh, um, south indian families they have this uh, uh, specification of a good education along with uh, side by side right. music training mm-hmm. and i think i got the best of both wow that's amazing mm-hmm. so uh-huh. and uh, yeah i mean of course uh, we can see uh, music started shaping your life before even you could realize that so yeah. when was like uh, you you said you uh, practiced till the age of 13 14 when you became conscious that you want to really pursue it as a career when was your uh, first ever performance maybe not as a professional player but huh. just the, what are your memories from the first performance that you gave in fact uh, it's very interesting to note because our first performance uh, was uh, in a kind of an amphitheater so it was in bhopal oh. in india in uh, madhya pradesh so okay. i was just 11 years old and my sister nandini was just 8 years old and mm-hmm. we performed on the stage and it was such a beautiful open air amphitheater and uh, with uh, both my uh, grandmother and mother sitting in the front row in the audience mm-hmm. and you know you can have you can see all the apprehension in their face the excitement in their face because you know young little girls are going to perform and yeah. it's not like uh, it's not like real real professionals coming on stage but then you know two mm-hmm. two young little girls going to the stage to get some encouragement so <laughs> for us itself i think we were uh, uh, i think i was uh, a little nervous definitely because it was the first time mm-hmm. i was entering uh, the stage but right. then uh, i was also very happy since it was me and nandini together so uh, uh, it was very memorable and i still remember we played the rag malkons you know now oh, malkons right. is a rag in fact mm-hmm. uh, he, uh, i i don't think if i have ever said this before but rag malkons is one of those ragas which we began our training in indian classical with mm-hmm. and that raga you can't believe i played it for about just that one raga for about one and a half to two years we were wow. playing only that rag at home for one and a half years because our training was very intense because mm. you know the concept is about that till you're not deep rooted in one raga you cannot move on to the next right you have to go within you have to go deep you have to explore you have to be with the notes you have to be with the entire composition you have to revolve around that entire space of mm. improvisation then you can say you know then you are qualified to present a rag anywhere in right. fact according to me uh, you know if i was supposed to give a performance somewhere of one minute mm-hmm. you know i would definitely have to put in at least 100 days for it minimum <laughs> wow. definitely <laughs> and so, uh, I, yeah yeah so it goes to say that uh, things don't come easy but uh, mm. the first performance was very memorable because we got a lot of encouragement from a lot of elders from a lot of our uh, seniors and uh, it's just the blessings of everybody the good wishes of everybody which has kept me going right and uh, you mentioned rag malkons i personally know it's a melodious it's just uh, it's something else i have been mm-hmm. i like i have heard that raga num- numerous times uh, mm-hmm. in the city of bangalore and all those concerts so it's it's amazing you started and you stayed with that for almost 2 years it's that's remarkable so uh, of course after that you must have started performing on bigger and bigger stages so mm-hmm. for how long have you been performing on stage uh so i've been performing now for uh... okay more than 20 years uh wow. yes okay. more than 20 years in mm. fact uh, it the major turnover came i would say when i was uh, finishing my engineering studies mm-hmm. uh because uh, even there uh, uh, what used to happen was since i told you already in the beginning you know education was very important for us so right. yeah. uh, engineering was what i took up as my qualification and mm-hmm. that doesn't go to say by any means that music was ignored it was totally there and my right. days used to begin at 5 am in the morning i used to practice and then go to college and of course you know this being an engineer yourself that college is for 8 hours 
and then right. you come back home and then some days you practice even after coming but then uh, i think after my engineering what happened was it was a turnover point because we started performing a lot of concerts that year mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was so good traveling performing meeting people learning more practicing more i got more time so then i decided i want to take this up full time yeah so mm -hmm. um, uh, once you like I'm sure after taking up full time, you got even better opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you recall one or two, some of the most memorable performances or the biggest ones that you have really uh, been at, that you've given? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, most memorable, there are many. But I think also, uh, I think I, I, I'd like to say two of them. Right. So uh, the first one is when I really performed my first first solo concert okay. i think it was very memorable because you know to enter the stage mm -hmm. and uh, to face an audience totally alone to present what you feel to express your own inner self in front of the audience through your music it's a very big deal and also uh, when you face an audience you also realize so many things as to how to present your music how to take care if something goes wrong and uh, you know a lot of small things mm, how right. to be really in the moment it it taught me a lot of things at that age itself and in fact that was uh, and in fact i waited till i gave my first uh, solo concert i didn't hurry with it at all it was at my at the age of 21 when i finished my engineering studies i waited long enough because uh, my grandmother is of the very firm opinion that uh, that uh, till children are of a certain uh, standard till they can be ready to uh, you know have have the ability to perform a full concert and not only that carry it off very gracefully very nicely mm -hmm. they shouldn't enter the stage so right. that's why i think i waited till 21 and finally when i entered the stage it was very nice because then i knew that it was all it was worth uh, the effort worth waiting all this time because mm -hmm. it really prepared me to go to the stage. Right. <laughs> and also, yes, uh, because uh, we were on this uh, topic. Uh, so another very interesting uh, concert experience, which has been extremely memorable for me, I think. Uh, it was this year, right this year, 2020, before okay. uh, pandemic uh, uh, grew, you know. So right. it was uh, in... Um, it was in February, I think, uh, beginning February, yes, if I'm not mistaken. I think mid feb yes. Okay. So uh, I was at this, um, uh, I was at Isha Foundation in Coimbatore, which is, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Sadhguruji's foundation. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most memorable experiences of my life because I think for the first time I performed before an audience of almost a million people. Wow. So, uh, and, and you were fact, talking about the live audience there, the people who were sitting. Yeah. Yes, wow. the live okay. audience. In fact, when I was there, people told me it was somewhere around, uh, you know, six, seven lakh people. But then later on, by sources, later on, I came to know that it was almost close to a million. And, uh, you know, just to envision that number itself is so, uh, is so humbling. Because when you go on the stage, you look at the grandeur of the stage. It's so majestic. It's so huge. And you have, you know, I mean, it's like scores and scores of people. Your eyes can't reach where the end is. Right. <laughs> so, True. It was very nice because uh, I think that concert was a, a first. It was a first of many kinds for me because, um, um, first of all, of course, so many people in the concert. So that itself was a very nice feeling because when you see so many people together at one shot, having your eyes on you, you know, it's a very warm feeling because you feel uh, uh, you feel very, very, um, you feel a heartwarming feeling to give back to them, you know, just right. seeing the love coming to you of so many people together. Mm -hmm. So that was the first. Also, another first was that it was the first time that I performed with a Carnatic musician. So... Uh, uh, and that too, it was in a, a very, uh, uh, very nice space because it was a mix of uh, two, three genres together. So mm -hmm. I think I loved it. And uh, also a first because uh, uh, I think uh, because it was one of those concerts where I just uh, didn't know anything much. 
we rehearsed hardly i think not even one day we didn't rehearse because i myself landed there like just one or two days before so and there were so many activities going around uh, the maha shivratri celebration it was basically for the maha shivratri celebration that okay. we performed there mm-hmm. and uh, so many people uh, were busy with so many things we didn't even have a proper rehearsal on the day uh, on the morning of the concert you know the concert was in the evening in the morning i got the songs with me i mean uh, you know to uh, kind of prepare but then we didn't have a, we had just a very small rehearsal and the and in the evening it was just improvisation it, mm-hmm. i just sat on the stage i knew today is going to be a, a complete fun complete uh, how do you say complete let go so <laughs> it's very nice and of course sadguru revered sadguru he was in the audience that was mm-hmm. also there and of course if you seen the video i don't know there's a huge uh, adi yogi shiva statue behind uh, uh, behind us performing right and uh, right. of course uh, also uh, uh, there's a there's an acrylic violin which i've used in that it's unlike the violin which i'm using now mm-hmm. but uh, it's uh, it looks like a glass violin which also lights up and uh, so yeah. many many things uh, for me with that concert and the amount of people who uh, got back to me after that concert i mean who have written to me through social media through various platforms i mean the love that i've got from that concert is just tremendous i'm ever grateful <laughs> that's why it's one of the most uh, memorable experiences for me it has to be like 1 million is a lot you mentioned mm-hmm. a couple of things about of course the violin you mentioned yeah. about the carnatic uh, music classical music genre so mm-hmm. uh, and but you are, but before that we want to get uh, into your mind so what do you how do you prepare se- yourself before uh, uh, before any kind of preparation much less mm-hmm. uh, performing in front of 1 million people mm-hmm. how do you get yourself into that zone where you can you focus and as you said let go so mm. what is what are your what is your preparation routine okay preparation in the sense that i'll tell you what happens when now before i go into the stage what happens mm. so uh, when i go before i go into the stage i really love to be in a space of calm in a space of calmness because that's the most important thing because when you have a clear mind when you have a relaxed mind everything just flows it's right. it's about being in that space of stillness before a performance i mean no matter how many people come and talk to you before a performance i know that that 5 minutes before going to that st- go, before going into the stage they are my 5 minutes because those 5 minutes i would like to be totally zen totally calm and uh, i think uh, also what happens is that there have been times when uh, i have been in a great hurry there has not been time for that stillness i just mm-hmm. have to jump onto the stage because it happened once that uh, i had to catch like three flights to get to a concert and i uh, got ready somewhere in the airport and then mm-hmm. just directly on the way to the concert so right. uh, no time so of course in the car you know you're still in the space of hurry to reach the concert venue but then what happens is that once you enter the stage the stage is also a very sacred space because mm-hmm. it's it's not just a space where you express your music but it's also a place where you give and receive love with the audience right. so i mean the moment you enter the stage at least for me this is what happens that when i sit on the stage i'm in a space where i feel uh, where i feel a very profound connection connection not just uh, with with myself but also with my instrument and also with the audience so that way what happens is that the vibe that you have automatically gets transferred to the audience yeah. and also it's vice versa also uh, you get vibes from the audience which come to you that's why get on the moment i go into the stage i feel like uh, uh, everything changes it becomes uh, uh, the space is a sacred space it's a very divine space and i've learned to really respect it honor it and uh, even more so because of performing with my family they have uh, they have really instilled in me the reverence of the stage mm-hmm. <laughs> that was something profound stillness before a pro- performance and uh, so uh, when you talk about uh, you mentioned about the acrylic violin uh, yeah. and you said it's a glass violin like what kind what different kinds of violins have you played and can you talk something uh, about about the instrument in general for the for the audience and for us definitely 
Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, in my case, I consider myself very, very blessed, very lucky, because mm -hmm. when I was three years old, I definitely did not know the emoting capacity of a violin. Mm -hmm. Like how beautiful, how how beautifully the violin can actually sing and convey human emotions. You know, right. now when I have it with me, um, you know, as I'm growing up with all these years behind me, I feel how lucky I have been to have an instrument which actually conveys human emotions so well. So, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, really interesting because I haven't really bought a violin till now in my life. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't bought a violin. In fact, even the acrylic violin, it is my sister who bought it. And okay. she was the one, uh, she's the one who loves to experiment and try new things. So she thought, uh, why not buy one and uh, see, you know, how, uh, how nice it is. Because in our family, until then, we just have had normal violins. Mm. And it worked out uh, so well because the sound of that violin is very nice. And of course, uh, for people who've seen the video, it looks really nice. It lights up when you play. And, uh, and as such, I would say um, for uh, as regards violin selection and violin uh, choices, I think because we were uh, already when I was born, we had about uh, seven to eight violins already at home. So, mm -hmm. you know, the violin in even my current violin, which I'm playing on is actually a violin, which my grandmother, she, uh, she practiced on when she was, uh, when she was a little girl. Okay. So, so it's basically handing over, passing over of violins. Of course, we have very good, uh, uh, we have luthiers who do a good job of maintaining our violins. Otherwise, I've never had to uh, buy violins as such. Because also what happens is one more thing is there. Because I've been playing on one instrument for a very long time. You know, mm. you develop an attachment to the instrument somehow. Right. It just happens that uh, like I'm so comfortable with my violin that I would not necessarily want to shift to another violin tomorrow. If you ask me if I want to buy another one immediately, okay. I would not want to because even with the instrument, you have a bonding. You right. there is a uh, there is an attachment to the instrument that you don't want to let go of. <laughs> right. Uh, in fact, I've heard a lot of artists, maybe much like yourself, they treat their musical instruments as an extension of their own body. So mm -hmm. it gets attached in a certain sense. And uh, so you said the current violin that you just played on was mm. uh, passed on from your grandmother. How old is that instrument? Uh, good question, because I myself, uh, I don't know. It's quite old because uh, if my grandmother played with it when she was in her younger years, definitely mm. it will be uh, around 60 years, wow. I think. Yes, 60 years, definitely. And uh, and uh, with violins, uh, the older violins have a really nice sound. Even this violin is a European violin. And uh, with violins, um, it's really about personal preference. It cannot be said that, uh, you know, if I love a violin, somebody else has to like it. Because mm. uh, it's really personal preference. The sound, mm. the acoustic of it, your own feeling as you go over it. And not only that, even strings, uh, they play a huge role in it. Uh, strings mm. and the quality of your bow. In fact, bows, I have bought many because uh, I've kept on experimenting yeah. with it. And even for strings, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we, we were experimenting for a long time. And uh, Thomastic Infeld uh, Vienna is what I'm using right now, which is which is uh, really good for uh, for my mm. uh, for my playing. So right. yeah, so about violins, um, I I would say it's very very personal. It's very uh, preferential according to each one's individual needs and tastes. Right, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> A sixty-year-old violin is uh, something that many people wouldn't have heard. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a and, uh, and in fact, uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Sure, in sure, fact, please. on my violin, you know, he, uh, there will be, if you look, have a look at it, you know, right. there are parts which are, how do you say, uh, I don't know if I'm showing it well, yes. There yeah. are parts which are still, uh, how do you say, they'll be unfinished, Wearing, not polished, okay. bearing okay. off. Okay. But you yeah. know, the beauty of these violins is that if you want to maintain the quality of sound, then mm. you don't change the, then you don't polish it because if you, okay. it is polished, it will uh, alter it. Not that it cannot be done, but I prefer it to be the way it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> so uh, you also mentioned about, uh, so you are a Hindustani, do you identify yourself as a Hindustani classical violinist? That's Definitely. how you describe? 
Yeah. Yes. And and uh, your first performance with Carnatic uh, uh, artist was this year. So mm -hmm. tell us something about the different genres in Indian classical music. Okay, so now Indian classical itself uh, is an ocean. So mm -hmm. it is uh, never ending. It's very very vast. Of course, you have your uh, the main two genres in India in uh, Indian classical are the North Indian, the Hindustani style, and the Carnatic, which is the South Indian style. In right. fact, uh, uh, in fact, me myself, uh, uh, I had started learning Carnatic for about two three years in the beginning. Right at the beginning, before I started Hindustani, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, because my grandmother belonged to the south also, and she also had a solid training in it. So mm -hmm. before, of course, when she was uh, uh, fifteen and she moved to the north, and you know, before uh, that she was trained. So mm -hmm. um, so coming back to the question, so basically there are two main genres of Indian classical. There is the North Indian and South Indian. Apart from that, of course, you have uh, uh, the light classical music uh, genre, which has a whole, which is a whole world in itself. You have Thumri, you have Dadra, you have Tappa, Chaiti, Kajri, Hori, you know, Bhajan. Wow. There, are, there are so many varieties. So Indian classical is very, very expansive. And in fact, uh, for any artist, uh, in fact, for myself, I would say that not just for myself, this I think applies to a, a grand majority of musicians that when you select a particular genre, you know, it okay. takes a lifetime to master and then right. you don't from it. That's the reason why Indian, uh, why Hindustani music is uh, a genre which, uh, which I personally find extremely appealing, which I, um, uh, which I find it very dear to my heart for the simple reason that it has a very um, it has a space of improvisation it has a very deep sense of taking the music giving it an identity according to how you have learned it but at the same time giving your own freedom of expression to it so for example any raga for example if i take up a raga like say um, any raga for example malkons we were talking about malkons now right. what happens with malkons is that my grandma, my grandmother and my mother, they would have taught Malkons to me in a, in a certain manner, the way Malkons should be rendered, which is absolutely the most purest form of the Raga technique available. So they teach me this. And then what happens is that I refine it over the years. I refine it over the years. And then find, I also learn how to improvise over the years. And finally, what happens is the end product is still rooted in my tradition is still rooted with the same rules, with the same strictness of adhering to the rules of the Raga. But it also has my freedom of expression to it. So I would say there are there is roots and there is wings also. Because roots are my tradition. Wings are my freedom. They are my own imagination as to how I want to project the same Raga with my own inner right. uh, expression. You have a beautiful way of explaining things. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, coming to uh, experimentation with uh, different genres, uh, what kind mm -hmm. of projects are you involved in musically? Like, what have you been doing? Your collaboration? Tell us something yeah. about that. Definitely. In fact, uh, collaborative space uh, for me is a very good energy because you just not have, uh, you just don't have just uh, yourself, but many other people, many other minds, many other different thought processes and ideas involved. So it's very nice because uh, something that you wouldn't have thought of, the other person mm -hmm. thinks of, and right. something that you think of, the other person wouldn't have thought of. So it's a very nice space if to, if uh, just not two people, if many people are really willing to come together for a common idea of uh, really, uh, how do you say, of uh, flowering a project, it will really work out well. And in fact, what happened, what has happened with me is that uh, the first very collaborative project which happened, which was which is not really a collaboration, but I still like to call it like that, is uh, with my own family. We do three generations of the violin, so oh, that's okay. also very, that's where it began from for me and then of course it went to other places but that's a very interesting space because um, uh, in in this particular space uh, it's particularly interesting because we don't rehearse together mm. we just come together we all know okay today we are going to play rag darbari okay let's sit on stage and then then all the how do you say the the eye contact the body language 
conveys it all and he just performs it's very spontaneous in fact that's mm. the way uh, music should be it has to be very spontaneous very very um, in the moment and mm. uh, as for other collaborations uh, of course i have um, uh, also uh, um, we have another group called in strings which is basically a group performed uh, by my mother dr sangeeta shankar and uh, my sister and me we are violinists all three of us and we have uh, a whole lot of other musicians i mean many many musicians if i name them you know there there are too many there are 10 musicians at least okay. so uh, so there is uh, there's tabla there's pakhavaj then you have drums then you have uh, keyboard guitar lot, lots of instruments and what we do basically is in uh, today's times actually to make uh, music indian music more palatable to the common masses so basically mm. in uh, in our group we have uh, a lot of original compositions but we also have um, how do you say uh, we have we have adapted compositions which are really popular in india i mean mm. like classical music compositions or general compositions which people know and we've uh, tried our best we've tried our, we've made our humble attempt to give a really grand sound to those popular tunes just with oh. with uh, with a different aspect uh, with more of a focus on getting the right sound out so it's a, so it's an experimentation again we use all our pedals we use our electric violins so uh, a lot of experimentation with that but uh, it's basically uh, to make music really really appealing to the masses because when when people like music which is presented in like 3 3 4 4 minutes short pieces you know then they want to listen to more then they come back saying oh we want to attend your indian classical concert you know mm-hmm. right. because even uh, collaboration works exactly the same way even on youtube uh, the the music that we put out it is just for like 3 4 minutes which really gives the which gives uh, any common man an idea about what we do and then that 3 4 minute really pushes him to watch more you know or mm-hmm. to attend the live concert Yeah. and of course uh, there have been other projects also so uh, uh, of course i have another group with uh, with um, uh, uh, a lyricist irshad kamil so of course you must be knowing of him from uh, the hindi film industry so right. he has a group where uh, uh, basically uh, uh, he recites poetry and all of us play music with him so it's singing okay and violin and piano and it's very nice because it's a first of a kind where poetry actually has music along with it and it's really interspersed very very beautifully mm-hmm. so uh, yeah and uh, what else of course yes uh, also uh, um, uh, i travel to france sometimes uh, so there is also a french project uh, that i've done uh, in the past so which has involved uh, some french musicians as well as indian musicians and it's been oh. very enriching because um it's like two different worlds indian classical and western contemporary coming together in one space and uh, very uh, uh, i mean there are many differences there are some similarities but many differences and coming together of these energies so that was also an interesting space because it taught me new things also and also I'm sure. with, uh, french musicians uh, is easier for me a little bit because i speak a little french so <laughs> oh, oh, <that's> <laughs> so, so i can i can manage to communicate right, right. so mm-hmm. i'll just uh, let the live audience know that if you want to uh, start asking questions and now is the right time we'll just go through one more question quickly and then we'll uh, open the floor for q and a and then yes. we will have a short performance from ragni uh who will be playing something uh, melodious i'm sure so uh, what about uh so you spoke about uh, uh performing with your family right yeah. so how was it different with, while performing with your family versus any other artist that you might have collaborated with mm-hmm. uh with family i think i've grown up with it i have uh, it's now it's it's very natural to go and sit on the stage with my family and perform but i still remember the first time i was performing on stage with with my grandmother i think i was really really nervous <laughs> because you know can you imagine a young uh, how old was i i don't really remember but a young girl in her teens uh, you have, know uh, assisting her so- grandmother in the performance so and here is my grandmother who's had like so many years of experience 
of practice of expertise behind her and here is a young girl who's trying to match up to her uh, to her uh, level of expertise uh, but i think it taught me a lot because it really made me uh, it pushed me to do better in fact every day that is my only thing uh, whenever i uh, sit for my riyas sit for my practice this is the only com- thing which comes to my mind as to how can i better myself every day i mean better than yesterday that's the only thing which comes to my mind and um, also the reason i do it is because inwardly i feel a real uh, i have a real uh, connection towards the music towards i mean uh, i think for any this goes for of course any profession even your profession it's the same thing right inwardly if there is uh, the passion is not there it doesn't come but i think it's uh, uh, just the uh, the aspect of sitting with her on stage itself taught me a lot of things of course over the years i've grown to be very comfortable on stage now with her and performing with other musicians i think it's a very different space because uh, uh musicalities um the how do you say the the understanding of music the way of approaching music is different with different people so somewhere what happens is that when you're collaborating with someone imagine suppose i'm collaborating with someone who has a completely different vision in mind with respect to mine you know at that time what happens is that you arrive at a common ground where you not only incorporate the other person's uh, ideas but also yours but come to a place where it's really agreeable to you know both of you so it's a very interesting space and i think if two people are really committed to uh, towards a project i think the idea becomes bigger than the thought process behind the idea i mean the final goal is more important of creating something beautiful rather than sticking on to my idea or your idea so you know i think that's the only difference otherwise collaboration generally i enjoy because you meet new people you go to new places it's everything new about it right who doesn't like it yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, let's get to some uh, audience questions. Yeah. So Sanchit Agarwal has a question: How do you play complex alaps on a violin? Hmm. Is it something that comes naturally without conscious thinking, or do you mentally break it into individual notes first? Okay, very interesting question because I think a lot of music students have this question also. So. Uh, whether it comes naturally without conscious thinking yes now for me it comes naturally without conscious thinking i don't have to think at all i just have to sit and play <laughs> but then uh, for anyone who's starting off i think uh, what is more important is to really be with the music like for example uh, i'll give a very small tip like for example if you select three notes or four notes of a particular ala uh, phrase mm-hmm. what you have to do now is consciously move your mind around those three four phrases and try different combinations of playing those three four phrases mm-hmm. consciously try to at least make five different combinations of those three four notes i mean i i said three four phrases but take three four notes and just form different phrases around those three four notes and go on repeating this b with one space itself like for example i have the notes ga ma dha ni ma l ga s you know now i am only going to be around those notes for the next 10 minutes i will not move i will do any combination i'll start with ma i will start with ga i will start with the i will start with ni i will wait on this note for a long time i'll wait on this note for a short time i'll double this note i'll basically an expression of your inner creativity first it may seem very mechanical that you're you're having to okay i'm starting from this note ending on this note okay i'm doubling this note okay i'm making this note long it will seem very mechanical but i think that mechanical process slowly 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 you know it somewhere becomes uh, how do you say um, it becomes an automatic process after some time because you have been with that space for a long time it's just like it's just like i will tell you uh, for example you're cycling you fall down you know you know you have to get up after some time once you've learned you don't have to think you just <laughs> go on rolling the cycle you know it's, it's the same thing at first it may seem very forced very mechanical very repetitive but it's about staying in one space and repeating it around that space you know for anything there is no shortcut really so even with this uh, it's the same thing uh, i think that would be a very useful one because i'm sure we have a lot of people who are uh, pursuing one or the other instrument as a hobby at google mm-hmm. and we have another question from rupa 
how many hours would you practice on any normal day hello rupa <laughs> thank you for the question uh, so uh, you know when ever anybody asks me this question i'm always at a loss of words as to what to say uh, i'll tell you why because according to me um, you know you cannot really quantify a music in terms of practice of number of hours i'll tell you why because uh, because what happens is that when you sit with music in general you know when you're sitting for your practice you're doing something which is really really uh, uh, how do you say it's very sacred my everyday practice is very sacred so i don't want to count the number of hours rather what i do is i see the quality of music how well am i able to practice every day am i able to give my best in fact some days it also happens where of course this this happens to every musician i'm sure where you feel that you don't feel like practicing as much as you would like to do on other days it happens even to musicians it happens but that does, uh, at that time what do you do you at that time you can do something else so i'll tell you my example so if ever it comes to that point where today i feel oh my back is paining i cannot really practice today for health reasons or whatever reason so then i would use that time for listening to music or doing some other activity related to music for example organizing my travel or organizing something else you know so but on an average i think uh, for uh, um, any beginner i don't know if you're asking for a beginner or for a uh, 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 professional musician but i think somewhere around 4 to 5 hours is a good uh, uh, is a good number to keep in mind even if you take breaks and do it in the day it's perfectly fine in my own case i'll tell you how i do it so my own practice is divided into morning and night so i do it two times in the day and uh, also i take breaks every 45 minutes i get up i stretch around because uh, our violin playing posture is such you know you tend it, it can tend to uh, tighten the back muscles so i get up i have my own routine of uh, doing yoga of doing surya namaskar and all that mm. so and then i sit again and uh, whenever i sit the only there's only one criteria for practice i'll tell you you know you have to be in the music whether you're sitting for 5 minutes whether you're sitting for half an hour or one hour the thing is you have to be in the music if you're thinking of something else and practicing i think it will not work because you're not one with the instrument so i think your mind and your instrument they have to be one there has to be oneness right right i think that's something that even uh, engineers and uh, you know, at google can follow just uh, get up every 45 minutes and stretch so <laughs> we have uh, one more question from hubert uh, yeah. who is from france uh -huh. how many times can you stay without playing the violin one day or more and he's from your uh, favorite country for collaboration uh, yes <laughs> Uh, so how many times can you stay without playing the violin one day or more okay yeah. so it happens that when i travel sometimes some days practice doesn't happen which is which which is very natural you are traveling you are with musicians and you can't really practice that day so uh, those days it is perfectly fine that you skip uh, skip your practice it is inevitable i mean it's unavoidable is what i should say so mm -hmm. but otherwise as much as possible i think it is uh, uh, um, i think i think it's very much uh, a part of how do you say it's very ingrained you don't have to think you just get up and practice uh, unless of course if there is a health issue then i avoid like for some days which uh, can happen you know it can happen to right. anyone otherwise it's become very ingrained it's just like any one of your other daily activities which you would do every day yeah unless of course there are constraints sometimes there are constraints which prevent you but right. uh, but as far as possible your own willingness try to do it every day sure mm -hmm. so uh, i think uh, we'll uh, jump to the performance part of it because uh, yeah. we are short on time yes uh, yeah i think uh, yes. you can tune your violin and we can begin yes uh, uh, so i'll be presenting today uh, rag bhim palasi because we are at uh, 3:52 uh, pm indian uh, time so yeah. it's a very uh, apt time for uh, an afternoon raga and since indian classical music ragas are sung according to specific times so bhim palasi is a very apt time suited to, to now so uh, okay. just give me a moment i'll set up sure. and I'll Mm-hmm. 
was absolutely wonderful. Thanks a lot, Ragni, for treating mm -hmm. us with that melody. And thanks for coming here. Thanks for talking to us. And I'm sure all the people are virtually clapping for you. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. <laughs> thank you so much. It was uh, an honor being here. And uh, thank you uh, so much to everybody at Google for having me over. And uh, for me, I really uh, enjoyed my time with all of you. That's, thank you. Thank you.